Euro 2020 is now unfortunately behind us, and although in the end it didn't come home, I think we can all agree that on the whole it was a pretty amazing tournament, far better than Euro 2016. Now that it's been a few days since the final, the dust has settled and everyone has sobered up, I think it's time to look back on Euro 2020 without the England tinted glasses on and pick my team of the tournament. The three Lions had a pretty special tournament, but I do think that because of that, there is a tendency to ignore the other 23 teams that participated this summer, which is a real shame because there were a lot of really interesting sides and loads of players who massively stood out but had to go home early. That's why I'm giving myself a restriction for this team. Only one player per country. This means that while this team isn't quite truly the best 11 players in the tournament, it also won't just be full of English and Italian players, which, let's be honest, would be quite boring, and it gives me a chance to talk about some other great players who may not have got their deserved recognition otherwise. Before I begin, I would like to preface this with the fact that this format forced me to make some extremely tough decisions. There is one in particular, a player who in my opinion was the second best player in the entire tournament who had to miss out on this team altogether, for reasons I'll explain when I get there. Anyway, I think I've waffled on for long enough now, so let's begin building the team. Let's begin with a player who went out in the last 16, but in my opinion had been the best player in the tournament up until that point by miles. Possibly the most polarising player in world football, Paul Pogba. Everyone has strong opinions on this man, but I've always been of the belief that he's an absolute Rolls Royce of a footballer, and even his critics can acknowledge that in his four games at Euro 2020, he was utterly sensational. On screen now are some of his standout stats for the tournament, and it's clear that he's the absolute complete midfielder, tenacious and hardworking, but also a ball carrying extraordinaire with an unbelievable range of passing to go along with it, and at times he looked like he was single handedly dragging France through games. Now, while I had just said that up until the last 16 when France were eliminated, Pogba had been the best player of Euro 2020, I cannot allow myself to award player of the tournament to someone who only played four games. So next to Pogba in midfield is my actual player of the tournament. Let's be honest, Italy could have had five or six players in their team in the tournament, but in my opinion, Jorginho was the best player for the best team, so he is an automatic inclusion. Italy's conductor averaged 70 passes per game with a 93% completion rate, and he was a huge reason why Italy were in complete control in every game they played, except for the one in the semi-final, where they were outpossessed by possession king Spain. But even in that game, this was when Jorginho had his iconic moment of the tournament, scoring a penalty so cool that it would have even impressed his predecessor, Andrea Pirlo, and taking Italy through to the final with it. Next, I think it's time we talk about left-backs. Oddly, left-back was the position of the most standout players this tournament, with four having unbelievable tournaments. These were England's Luke Shaw, Italy's Leonardo Spinazzola, Denmark's Joachim Mela, and Switzerland's Steven Zuba. Notably, three of these players, Zuba, Mela, and Spinazzola, are right-footed but played left-back, which was somewhat of a theme this tournament. Anyway, I couldn't bear to leave three of these great left-backs out, so I've picked two. As he is right-footed and his normal position is right-back, I've selected Joachim Mela as my right-back. With two goals and an assist in six games, he was extremely dangerous going forward, linking up very nicely with Mikhail Damsgaard. His right-footedness meaning that either of them could go inside or outside at any time. In particular, his demolition of Neko Williams in the last 16 was such a mismatch that you actually felt sorry for the Welshman. Mela completed 2.4 dribbles per 90 in the tournament, which is the most out of any fullback to have reached the knockout stage. So with Mela on the right, that leaves me three left-backs to pick for my other fullback. The key here is that Shaw and Spinazzola's countries both reached the final, which means that I have no shortage of worthy players from their countries to pick for this team. For example, I already have Jorginho for Italy, and for England, it's a toss-up between two other players, which I'll get to in a bit. So for this reason, Switzerland's Steven Zuba is my left-back. Zuba finished Euro 2020 with four assists, which was the most in the tournament, and it's remarkable when you consider he only started three games. He averaged 2.8 shot-creating actions per game, by far the most amongst fullbacks. In general, his progressive passing numbers, which are on screen now, were outstanding. Now it's time to choose some attackers, and let's start with our number nine. I think there are three worthy contenders for this slot, Cristiano Ronaldo, Romelu Lukaku, and Patrick Schick. Obviously, two of these are global superstars who you would have expected to be in the race for Golden Boot, while the other was Cristiano Ronaldo. Anyway, I think any of these three could have been very worthy inclusions with Ronaldo and Schick on five goals each, and Lukaku on four but my choice is Patrick Schick. Four out of Schick's five goals were from open play, including his 54-yard goal of the tournament against Scotland, which for me just edges him ahead of Ronaldo, whose five goals consisted of three penalties. I would also put him ahead of Lukaku on the basis that he managed to outscore him, despite the Belgian having significantly better service with the likes of Kevin De Bruyne creating chances. Schick's five goals came from an XG of 2.2, showing his ability to score from not the greatest chances and his average of 80 minutes per goal across five games is exceptional 
in a team who weren't favourites in many games they played. And again, he scored the goal in the tournament. That goal was ridiculously good. On the left side of our attack is a man who should link up nicely with Schick, having spent a season playing alongside him at Leipzig. My choice for the left wing is Sweden's Emil Forsberg. Four goals in four games is a pretty exceptional return for a man who didn't even really play as an out-and-out -out attacker. He played as a left midfielder in a 4-4-2. Forsberg ranked fifth in the entire tournament for dribbles per game, providing flair to an at times quite rigid Sweden team, and it is worth noting that Sweden only scored five goals and he scored four of them. A worthy inclusion who flew somewhat under the radar amongst other wingers such as Federico Chiesa and Raheem Sterling. And now that I've mentioned him, yes, Raheem Sterling is the man that I was talking about in the intro when I said that someone had to be left out extremely harshly. I said that Jorginho was my pair of the tournament, and for me, Sterling would be second. However, he had to be left out for reasons we will discuss now. I found centre-backs by far the most difficult spots to fill for this team. I think that both England and Italy centre-back pairings, Stones and Maguire and Chiellini and Bonucci, were outstanding. But after that, there was a major drop-off in terms of quality centre-back performances this tournament. Initially, I had immediately put Jorginho and Sterling straight into the team at defensive midfield and left wing, respectively. But then I realised that this meant I couldn't pick two centre-backs that I was happy with. So unfortunately, Sterling had to drop out so I could bring in Harry Maguire. What a tournament this man had. He was injured for the first two games, and he came into England's side for the final group game and immediately caused England to look much better. Even though in his absence we hadn't conceded, we became even more solid with his presence, especially against Czechia and Ukraine, who each barely only had a sniff. But even more importantly, in my opinion, England's build-up and progression instantly improved with Maguire coming in. He is an excellent progressive ball carrier, and often brings the ball out of defence with urgency, which England really needed at times to prevent them from being so painfully slow in their build-up. He averaged 4.7 progressive carries per game, compared to just 2.8 for John Stones and 1.4 for Tyra Mings, and it is no coincidence that England immediately looked more creative and purposeful in attack after Maguire came into the side. So Maguire is one of our centre-backs, we'll come back to the other one later. It feels quite weird making a best 11 or something and picking 7 players before getting to the goalkeeper, but here we are. Clearly the two standout goalkeepers at Euro 2020 were Donnarumma and Pickford, but with England and Italy's slots taken up already, we can't pick them. But luckily, there was one goalkeeper who I thought was pretty outstanding in only three games. The one player in this team to have not made the knockout round, Finland's Lukas Radetzky, is my goalkeeper. In the first game, he managed to keep a clean sheet and save a penalty against Denmark, albeit under extremely unusual circumstances, following the horrific events around Christian Eriksen that day. It is fair to say that the Danish players were not completely focused on the game, and understandably so. But even so, it was a very good performance from the Finnish goalkeeper to keep a clean sheet, especially as they were under heavy pressure prior to the 41st minute. In Finland's next game, Hradetsky was only beaten by an absolute wonder goal from Anton Moranchik, and in his third game against a very deadly Belgium side, he pulled off seven saves and kept his team into the game until very late on. He scored a really unlucky own goal, but if not for Hradetsky, Finland could have easily conceded five or six as opposed to two against Belgium. Speaking of Belgium, let's talk about their star man. For his club, he generally plays centrally, but for Belgium this summer, he mainly played on the right of their attack. So for my team, the right-hand side of the attack is Kevin De Bruyne. To sum up De Bruyne, let's talk about Belgium versus Denmark, which was a contender for game of the tournament. At half-time, Denmark were 1-0 up and despite being huge underdogs, were genuinely dominating the game and looking a brilliant side who could have easily beaten Belgium. At half-time, on comes Kevin De Bruyne, who had not started owing to a slight knock, and instantly the game transforms. Belgium click into gear and are electric in the first half, coming back to win 2-1 against a really strong Danish side with De Bruyne leading the charge. He scored one and assisted the other and his interplay down the right flank with Lukaku was truly astonishing and just couldn't be defended against. The game just went to show what an influential player De Bruyne is. If he plays well, a whole team plays well, and he demonstrated that at spades at the Euros. A truly special player. We now only have two slots left to fill, one centre-back and one central midfielder, and there aren't very many countries left available for us to choose from. So anyway, let's pick the centre-back. Who could we have from these countries remaining? Um, oh, great. Yeah. Remember earlier that I mentioned that after England and Italy there was a drop-off in centre-back quality? Yeah, I've realised that there is only one centre-back that isn't from England or Italy that I can put in this team and still be able to sleep at night, and that man is Andreas Christensen, which unfortunately presents a problem. I already have a Danish player, Joachim Mailer, in the team, and he was, in my opinion, the best full-back in the tournament, and I've already bent my own rules to fit him in by putting him at right-back. Unfortunately, however, he's going to have to be switched out to get Christensen in, because like I said, after Christensen, there isn't another centre-back I'm happy to put in the team. So anyway, with Mailer out, I will select someone who actually played at right-back. So in will come Denzel Dumfries. 
So anyway, after that bit of rearranging, let's talk about Christensen and Dumfries, starting with Christensen. Aside from that magnificent goal he scored against Russia, which secured Denmark's miracle qualification from the group after having lost both their opening two games, the Chelsea man had a great tournament. Like Maguire, he has very good ball progression numbers, with 4.1 progression carries per 90, and his ball retention numbers when it comes to passing are similarly impressive, allowing Denmark to keep possession effectively and build attacks, which added to great effect, scoring two goals per game, and only Italy and Spain scored more goals. Christensen also, alongside Schmeichel and Kier, proved themselves to be great leaders in terrible circumstances, and this assured defensive unit did wonders to organise and galvanise the entire team. Moving on to Dumfries, it's fair to say that he was one of the real surprises of the tournament. He came into Euro 2020 with a record of 19 caps and zero goals, but in the Netherlands opening game, he was the unlikely goal scorer who rescued them to win after a vibrant Ukraine side pegged them back to 2 all. Even more unlikely, he then followed that up with another goal in their next game with a lung-busting sprint upfield to receive a square ball from Daniel Malin and steer the ball home. What was really noticeable about Dumfries' two goals and his positioning, on screen now are freeze frames of him receiving the ball from his goals in ultra-high and attacking positions, and this role of him bombing on from the right wing back to become an additional attacker created some really effective overloads for the Dutch in attacking positions, and is a big reason why they were able to score eight goals in just three group games. He averaged 1.5 shots per game, which is the third amongst all fullbacks to play 120 minutes or more behind only Mailer and Spinazzola. Now finally, onto the last spot in the team. The original plan was for the third central midfielder to be Frankie de Jong, but once I realised I had a centre-back crisis and Mailer had to be switched to Dumfries to make space for Christensen, that in turn meant I could no longer have Frankie de Jong, thanks to this one person per country rule. So instead, my third central midfielder is Pedri, who also had an exceptional tournament. Only 18, Pedri showed players much more experience than him how it's done all summer and injected some much needed youthful flair, dynamism and agility into an oftentimes slow and immobile Spanish midfield. He really excelled at linking midfield and attack, often drifting left, to nicely link up with Jordi Alba and whoever was playing on the left wing for Spain, most commonly Dani Olmo or Pablo Sarabia. He averaged 3.3 shot creating actions per 90, which was the second highest to Spain amongst players of 300 minutes or more behind only Dani Olmo, who operated significantly higher up the pitch. He also averaged 10 passes per 90, which entered the final third. Only Koke had more for Spain, and this shows how important Pedri was for Spain for progressing the ball and initiating attacks. So there's my Euro 2020 team of the tournament with only one player per nation. In goal, Lucas Radetzky, my back four, Steven Zuba, Harry Maguire, Andreas Christensen and Denzel Dumfries, my three in midfield, Jorginho, Paul Pogba and Pedri, and my front three, Emil Forsberg, Kevin De Bruyne and Patrick Schick. Of course, like I said earlier, the format for this team forced me to make some incredibly tough decisions and there were so many brilliant players who just narrowly missed the cut and here are a few of them on screen. Thank you so much for watching this video. I had a really great time making it and I would massively appreciate a like or a subscribe if you enjoyed. The month we've just had with the Euros has been one of the best in my life, with England nearly going all the way. I feel like I spent most of my evenings covered in pints that had been chucked in the air at the pub. Anyway, on to 2022 where it could really come home. I'd like to get out a video soon previewing the upcoming season, not just in England but for all of the major European leagues and after that I'm hoping to do some other more specific ideas I have for videos. Anyway, thanks for watching again. And see you next time.